Welcome to another episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me as always is Mr. Chris Halstrom. How are you today, Chris? I'm doing good, Jody. That was impressive radio announcer voice. <laughs> hey, welcome to Inside the Recording Studio podcast. Yes. Yeah, no, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm trying to stay awake for this lovely episode. It's, it was a late night last night and an early morning this morning, so I'm a little oh. slow on the uptake. I'm going to just say that right now. Well, rise above, man. Rise above. Be a professional. That's right. Yeah. Speaking about rising above... How about that low end? Yes. Low end of a kick. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I barely landed it. I barely <laughs> landed it. But the idea is that we're going to talk about How five do you tips. Kick kicks? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you get a lot of argument by saying that a kick is a substantial part of the energy to just about any musical style. Especially if it's a popular form of musical style. Right. It is obviously something very important, and I think it's something that most people try to get right, you yeah. know, uh, or at least appropriate. So it is an important part. And as we were putting together the notes here, I was just trying to think about the importance of a kick, and we can kind of take it for granted. But imagine hearing an EDM track or a hip hop track or even a rock track that didn't have a kick. I don't want to and imagine it, it. Yeah, exactly. I just so, don't. Ooh, yeah, now you're. Yanni or something like that, right? So, <laughs> even he had uh, kick drum sounds, even though they were probably all synthesized. Well, synthesized or not, getting the kick right is... Hard to know, do it's, sometimes. It's, it, it certainly can be. It certainly can be. So I guess we'll start at the lowest end, the fundamental here. And depending on the size of the kick or the source that we have... Where do you see that range? Where do you sort of start your listening if you need to do some either corrective or additional EQ to a kick? Where do you go first? I'm thinking somewhere between the range of about 45 to 65 or 70. I know you go a little bit further down than that, but to me it's right around 45 to 70-ish in that range. Yeah, it is kind of surprising, or at least it was to me when I – for started realizing this, how low the kick can actually go. And I'm not necessarily talking about a sub, but the actual fundamental there and the weight. Yeah. Because it's easy to think that, you know, it, it's a bit higher, but it really isn't. So in my experience, around that range where you said. That's, that's where, where it where also gets rather difficult because a lot of studio monitors technically have a harder time going down that low effectively. Yeah, yeah. Without a sub. Right. There's a lot of headphones that claim, hey, you know, we go down to 20 hertz. Good on you. How well are you really going to hear that 20 hertz moving in your ear hole on a set of headphones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is that. But, you know, that's an important part, though. I mean, my Genelex, they don't go down very far. No, they so go to I 70. Have, yeah. That's, so I think the cutoff on the Genelec 1029As is 70 because I got a pair too. I believe it's 70. And the KRKs that I have, it goes down a little bit further. I think the KRKs go down to, I want to say, 55 or 60. It's not that low, which is right. why I'm happy that I have a sub because the sub makes it much easier for me to feel that fundamental. Feel it. Yeah. Feel the fundamental. Yeah, yeah that's where I, I don't have a sub. So I rely on my cans, headphones, just to kind of get that. And I've kind of learned that, uh, what the sound is, but you have to hear it because that's not getting represented in your speakers. You're like boosting and boosting and boosting. Oh, there it is. Finally, I can hear it. And then you're going to destroy somebody's <laughs> system when you play it somewhere else, right? If they don't go down so low. It's like having that sub is like, oh, oh, there it is. Yeah. That's where that fundamental is. That's what I'm missing. Right. You learn to kind of listen and find those frequencies just – one thing that you can do is just pull up like an EQ if it shows the, the input curve mm -hmm. and just spot that, right? And you can see there's general boost at that range, right? But you know what? Now, I, I don't like you, to mix using my eyeballs. No, but I'm saying as a learning tool sure. to kind of where, where to listen for, and you can very much see that, that that's where it's happening. Yeah. And you do that enough, and then you start hearing it, right? Mm -hmm. But it can certainly be a good teaching tool for learning to hear that and you can see where things really are and where they aren't. But of course, like you said, you mix with your ears and not with your eyes. We also have to 
learn where certain things are when we're hearing them. So, oh uh, yeah. Now I'm thinking primarily here from sort of like an acoustic kick drum, right? But okay, if you are dealing with, let's say that you're you're more in the hip hop camp, you might be using 808s or 909s. Yeah, but but the 808 is sort oh, of it's like the, the classic. The, the classic. Yeah. yeah. So. If you're just thinking of using it as a static kick and not necessarily one that's going to follow, say, like a harmony of a bass line or something, you're, you're actually using that as the whole foundation of your track, maybe even consider like a different pitch of that 808, right? Just moving up and down just to make it sitting right if you have a hard time getting it to fit in your mix. So there's something to think of that. That's a little bit outside of my expertise, but that's something to think about unless you're having it moving along with harmony. As someone who has actually done that, it is a good idea to take that kick and pitch it to the key, the home base, the Mm -hmm. root note of your key that your song is in. It will enhance how your song comes across if you do so. Yeah. It kind of grounds everything right there. And I think it was, it wasn't an 808, but Prince's track, is it When Doves Cry? Actually doesn't have a bass track in it. It's all like a Kick. tuned percussion, right. I think. Yeah. Well, as someone who's done crazy stuff in the past and bound to do it again in the future, I have a particular song where the kick is not a kick at all. It's a sample of a Harley starting. As you do. As you do. Right. Right? <laughs> right. You got that, the blah, 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 as the as a Harley is starting up. Yeah. That is Did my you just kick cut one of the, uh, one of the, revs there type of thing or just yeah. one of the blubs as yeah. you so eloquently said it yeah. exactly that is exactly what i did all right well <laughs> there you go if you want to sound different right that's cool but some you know experimenting with found sound there again that's yeah. a little bit outside of the topic here what we're talking to but but it gets um, you that really that was going for that concept of the, the low fundamental is like the harley kicking over it has a really low fundamental to it and it can work for a kick sound But the idea here also is that with the low-end range, the more you start to bump it up, the more you're going to start chewing up your headroom for your entire mix. That's easy to do because when you start boosting that and you're listening to it, it's oh, my God. I'm not getting enough thump in my gut, man. Let's turn it up. (laughs) Yeah. Again, referencing, walking away there every once in a while, but, you know, keeping in mind that I can't remember, I think it was – this guy calls himself Mixed by Mozart. Per okay. Se. How, you know, the, the, he called it the bank account of your mix, <laughs> right? You only have so much value to go around, and you don't necessarily want to eat it all up with your kick. It's something to keep in mind there. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll need to go back to up. Deutsche Bank. Yeah. I got nothing funny to say to that, so I'm just <laughs> okay. going to continue with the podcast. M- moving on. What's <laughs> moving the next on. area? This is part two, the second tip. What is it? Now I'm thinking a little bit higher, obviously, and I'm thinking the low end. I'm thinking between 90 and probably up to 150. Mm-hmm. In this range, I think it very much behooves you to be gentle because there is a fair bit of range, even though, or weight, I should say, it's a fair bit of weight in this range without it being the actual fundamental of the kick. Right. So anything that you do here, Boosts, I think, can work, but you might be better off boosting the fundamental in this case as opposed to boosting that because now you're starting to get it more into bass territory as well, right? Mm -hmm. So be a little careful there. And I would say the same thing is if you start getting too aggressive with cuts in this range, you're probably taking out more weight than you intend to. So in other words, what you want is more like the angel soft of toilet paper here. Gentle, exactly. Yeah. And that's how cleaning. I intend. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say that the fundamental of your kick is around 50. Now around 100, that's going to be your first harmonic of, of that same fundamental, right? So yes. you're, you shave off a lot of, of the tone and the weight of the kick by doing that, that low. So I tend to kind of stay away from that area. You was. I know. <laughs> I know. But... If I do something, it's very, very gentle in that area. So what about you, though? How do you treat, you know, let's say that you're dealing with a pop track and you have a, an acoustic kit on it. Mm-hmm. If you're dealing in that area, are you doing anything at all or do you tend to 
leave it alone. I no, I tend to do stuff there because it still will fit into most speakers at that point, mm -hmm. especially for a pop track. If you want something that's got a lot more gut kick to it that's going to thump you in the groin and the intestines, then, yeah, you got to go down to the fundamental and deal with it there. But usually it's easier when you have a sub. If you don't have a sub, <sighs> go get a sub. Anyway, <laughs> for getting a low-end kind of feel out of the kick, it's a lot easier in the low-end area that you're describing of 90 to 150 because most speakers can represent that. Obviously, laptop speakers have a harder time representing it, but it's not like it's invisible there. It's just don't overdo it. I agree that it shouldn't be drastic moves unless the kick is really poorly recorded or you need Well, there is that. Right. Yeah. So, so I, you're I'm not sure more... I wouldn't be incredibly gentle. I just wouldn't be – like angel soft gent. So you're thinking here, this is uh, an area of sort of speaker translation that you're yes. concerned with here. Right. Yeah. Okay. Speaker translation oh, is pretty good there. Yeah, because it's still low enough to have some weight, but it's not the, like you said, it's not the It's not the gut punch. Gonna, yeah, it's not going to kick you in the chest right yeah. there. A little bit too high for that. But it's going to allow you to feel it though, in a sense. Yeah, from absolutely. An esoteric standpoint. What was that esoteric volume? Was that your <laughs> phrase from a couple of episodes I can't remember what that ago. phrase was. It was something that you really liked, so you should remember. Well, maybe I'll, I'll have to go back and re-listen then. Uh, yes. But yeah. All right. So what's next? Boxies ness mm -hmm. Boxes and boxes of sound. This is where your kick is going to get you into trouble in a sense in some genres. In other genres, it's actually kind of necessary to be there. But this area is more of the 200 to 500 range, which is generally the weight of a lot of other instruments. This is kind of the boxy area of the kick. I agree. To me. Yeah, to me, it, it has that very, and I think the word boxiness to describe it is very apropos here because it does start sounding like a cardboard box to me. It has that, yes, it's a very natural sound of a kick drum, but it's not a pleasant one. So in most productions that I do, I get super aggressive here. Really? Why, well, where's your most aggressive frequency in this range? It would depend on the, the fundamental of the kick, but it's generally, I would probably start dipping probably to the lower end of that, maybe at like three yeah. And then see where it is. And yeah, I'd agree with that. Somewhere in the 275 to 325 range is right. more of my value. And that. I'm not shy here with the width either. You know, I don't want to go down so that it starts taking out. You and, take a wide you, cue, do you? I do. Especially for like rock stuff because it just, it's unpleasant. Rack so them I, up. I want, here comes the cue ball, <laughs> according yeah. to Chris. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just knock it out. I'm not shy here at all. Mm -hmm. right. So I, I usually just use my ear, obviously, to, to get how much I can without taking all the life out of it. But I am not gentle here. I'm like, yeah, 10, 11 dB cut. Yep. Go for it. Just take it all out. That's Don't like the care. Grand Canyon right there. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's, you know, the, we've said sort of half jokingly in the past, where it's like, if you're EQ starts looking like for an ad for an EQ, it's not recorded properly. Yeah. But the reality here in this case is that a kick drum has a range there. It has sound there. Of course. It's just not pleasant in your mix, and it takes up space from other instruments. Now, this is fairly genre-specific because let's say if you're doing like a jazz track. Trio, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to be aggressive cutting here if you do any cutting at all because you want that sort of like roomy sort of natural vibe more than likely you don't yeah. want to like hyper produced kick on your jazz kit right it's so just when you start pulling out like 10 11 db that's hyper produced mm -hmm. on your kick is that what you're trying to say well no but i'm saying i'm not if you're let me turn that argument around i get okay. where you get where you're trying to get at but if you have a jazz trio mm -hmm. you have a lot more room what? for all kinds of information in there that's for sure. Right. There is that. And it's also, from my perspective, I'm probably listening for a more of a natural sound of three or four people playing in a room. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what a kick sounds like naturally in a room. So you might take some out, but 
that's part of the live feel. If you end up sculpting it too much, at least to my ear, it just starts sounding unnatural for what you're trying to accomplish. So don't go Michelangelo on it is what you're saying. I say be gentle if you're doing a jazz thing. <laughs> right, now, on a jazz if thing. You're, I'm just talking yeah. about your style is more Michelangelo yeah, my, well, yeah, marble I mean, for the statue of whatever. Yeah, I'm not gentle here at all. It's one of those things that where I had to get over the sort of saying that, oh, you should never boost or cut more than a few dBs, right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, in this case, it's what's appropriate. You know, I just take all that out because I have the weight of from, let's say, 150 on down below, right? That That's what the weight is. And then as we'll cover here going on forward, I'll get other elements of the kick to be present. But in that range to me, there's nothing there that the bass drum is going to carry. That's so, going to be guitars. That's going to be bass. That's going to be keys, whatever it is. The punch in that area would be like a lightweight boxer, but down at 40 and 50, <laughs> that's, that's Mike Tyson. So you're Tyson. talking more like Sugar, Le Sugar Ray Leonard? Well, I'm not sure I, I would pick him. But anyway, I'm not a boxing expert. But I Neither imagine like I. the low end is like that. That's Mike Tyson you're hitting in the face, right? Mm, so, all right. Or in the chest in this case, as it were. And you'd sure. probably break your chest. And, all right. Yeah. We'll move on to tips number four and number five right after these words from our sponsor. And we're back. And the next thing we're going to start talking about is click of the kick. Where is this at, Chris? I'm thinking now, I hinted at this before the break, but other areas of the kick drum to make it present for me and sucking out all the boxiness, and that's the, the click of the beater. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I tend to search for where it's going to be most appropriate for the song. Kind of takes a microscope sometimes to get that, doesn't it? It can. It just depends on what, what's going to sound good. I tend to do a, a sweep here with the gentle boost first not a super wide one not a super narrow one but i tend to go and end up somewhere around the one all the way up to maybe like a 4k range all right where just to find that click mm -hmm. and again here is it's context dependent right but if you want the more aggressive click of the beater you might have to go a little bit higher but it's just to make that stand out and especially if your mix is relatively dense mm -hmm. Um, so if you, you hold on a second, back, yeah. rewind, mm -hmm. here we go. You're talking about using a gentle cue sweeping kind of thing to find out where that is. To me, I would go more aggressive with the cue and a much higher push in order to sweep through a frequency range to find it. Why do you go gentle in a dense mix? When I say the I say a gentle boost. Maybe I didn't make myself clear that, but I don't with a click. Here it's you said it's gentle and wide. That's why I assume you mean no, a I wide said, cue. Okay, then I no, I, then I misspoke. I meant to say I don't have a wide cue when uh -huh. I do this. When I do this boost, okay. so this is it's not super narrow. It's not super wide. It's just a little bit of a boost, probably a couple of dBs, mm -hmm. and then I would sweep the frequency of that to find where it's the most pleasing, where it, it stands out to the amount that I want in said mix. Gotcha. I just think it's interesting you said that it was kind of wide and all that. And to me, to no, no. find that but, sweet spot, I would actually narrow up the cue pretty hard, find it by sweeping around in the area, and then open it back up and then do exactly as you just said with a couple of dB boost on a not – super wide cue, but a much narrower than a very focused. Like if you have a cue range that goes from zero to 10, I might be using 10 to find that kick yeah, click. And I, then I, I would bring it back down and open it up to like maybe five. Yeah. Generally, I would agree with you there when you're sweeping for frequencies uh -huh. to have a very narrow 10 dB boost perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Just yep. to find and sweep that frequency. In this case though, with the beater click, I don't necessarily feel that I need that much of it. So I, I find it just by ear and it's just, I, it's almost set where I want it to be and I just kind of sweep around that and I find where it is. Because right. yeah, it's not one of those where it's necessarily a, a pitch thing or like a ringing noise or anything no, that's ringing not. out there trying to find. So, so that, that's my methodology for not going like 
super narrow and wide on it. Gotcha. The other thing that probably should be mentioned here is that this is also style dependent. And as we were talking Very. before the break here, we were mentioning that jazz trio kind of thing. Your jazz trio is probably not looking for the beater click in, the, in your mix. Yes. Whereas in exactly. something that's like metal, you're going to want to have that click in there because you're getting so much guitar information and other things that are taking up so much room in the boxy area of your kick and everything else. And then you've got hopefully your super powerful punchy in the face bass as well that the kick will get lost. And when yeah. it gets lost, that beater click in a particular style will help bring it back. Yeah, it just makes it more present and you feel – right. Yeah, very much style dependent here just as with, like you said, the, the boxiness of the, of the mids where do you have that super EQ'd kick like you said in jazz? No, mm -hmm. it's going to sound out of place, right? And even the rock genres – if you're doing like an aggressive, more extreme form of metal, this is way more prominent. But even if you're doing, let's say, a similar realm, but you're going back to more like a 70s type of a thing with like perhaps a Led Zeppelin or maybe even like an ACDC thing, that click is not going to be as present. No. So it's sort of like you probably want to go what's sort of appropriate for the genre there and going for possibly a little bit more of a natural sounding kick. Whereas, you know, modern metal, there's nothing sort of like natural about it. It's all about extreme and in your face and, and all about emotion, that type of thing. Right. So, Rip the yeah. skin right off of my skull. Exactly. All right. Well, As what, tend to <laughs> what yeah. ends up being our point number five here? One thing that I think is important to bring up, and, and you hinted at that a little bit when we talked about the, the 100 range, mm -hmm. where getting your kick to come across all systems, whether that's, you know, you're listening on your iPhone, you got your earbuds in, whatever it happens to be. If you have a hard time getting that to translate, you might consider something like Waves R Bass, yeah. where I believe it works with adding in fundamentals and... I think it's psychoacoustically to kind of like hear certain things, but it adds weight to stuff. So that's something that you can do as well if you want your kick to be bigger or sounding bigger right. than it really is to add that in there. Waves is the only one to do that, but yeah, there are others. No, that's just the one I tend to think about because it's been around since 1846. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's the one that's in my, my plug-in folder. But very easy to overdo because it does sound exciting. And then all of a sudden you look at, hey, why am I clipping my master bus? Well, <laughs> it's because of all that low end. But what, what do you use? I mean, you mentioned other stuff. So do you ever reach for anything else or what, what do you what Yeah, do you to go for? there's one by BX. The interface is bright red. And if oh, I'm having sub filter, a, sub filter, that's it. Yep. And that is a really nice plugin to enhance mm -hmm. your kick in a dense mix as well. And to top that off as a logic dude, if I'm doing the mix in logic, which is rarer these days, or if I'm exporting my tracks from logic and I'm trying to produce like pre flight check on some sounds as they get exported. I might use Logic's sub bass filter in there too. It does a similar mm, yeah. thing on a slightly different level, but there are a few others out there that do similar things. And yeah. beyond that, if I go to like 5A, your bonus tip. Yes. If you're the one tracking this, I'm going to suggest you try a few different mics on your kick and get it from the source direct with a proper miking. Mm-hmm. Even though yeah. it, it sounds weird to say that a proper miking is going to help the EQ of a kick, but by far and away, when you mic things right and you get it right at the source, it makes your mixing so much easier. Yeah. Do it right the front. Yeah. Anytime that you can do, as, like you said, you correct as many things and get as good as you can as possible at the source, you're just saving yourself a headache mm -hmm. down the line. Or you're and, saving, or someone is saving you the headache if they do it right up front. Yeah. And also, as I guess we'll go 5C here on this one, or 5B <laughs> or whatever letter we're up to now. It's also easy to forget 
let's say that we're working on a mix and we go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting as much kick as I want. Well, that might not be an EQ issue because you do have a fader there, presumably, <laughs> that says kick. So just the volume, right, is, is, you know, it sounds laughable when you bring it up, but it, it's That's why I a common thing. Because you go, oh, man, I'm, I'm not hearing enough kick. I, I get a boost more at 50. Or, or, hear me out, you can just raise the fader up a little bit, you know. There you go. So it, it's, it's not always an EQ thing. But, but those ranges that we talked about there, I think, would get you in the ballpark of – the Most major leagues of mixing the EQ of a kick. Yeah, th that's the areas that, that kind of pay attention to. At least I do. All so. right, let's knock it out of the park now with Friday Finds. Chris, what have you got for us this week? Well, we got some interesting news this week, didn't we? Oh, yeah. With SoundWide. Mm -hmm. Now, what is SoundWide? To me, it's a little bit unclear yet if this is going to be a brand new company or just like an umbrella. But if you haven't heard of this, it is a uh, merger of sorts with Plugin the Lion Brainworks, Native Instruments, and Isotope. Yes. Where, from my understanding, is that it's going to be essentially an information sharing thing in the development of plugins. That can be interesting. Whether that's going to be great for every one of us or not so great. Well, that remains to be seen, but isn't I think the guy that invented J U C E otherwise known as juice, like part of this. I hadn't heard that, but that's very possible. I think he's part of this. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well then there's some hardcore technology changing hands there from, cause what I understand that juice is the, it's the language framework and for the, a lot of audio plugins. Yeah. Exactly. So we'll have to see, but you could argue that that's three very different bases of plugin development that are coming together under one tent. So oh, yeah. it's something that I'm going to keep my eyes on for sure. It's an interesting development. So that, that was the one that just caught my eyes. So that would have to be my Friday find for this week. What about you? What do you got? I'm a little bit behind the curve on this, being that I am a UAD user. However, Universal Audio has released a new system for its plugin architecture called Spark. And yeah. Spark allows you to get an unlimited license to use UAD plugins from a native standpoint and not need an Apollo to run their plugins or their shark system technology. So for those of you that would like to run UAD plugins without the Apollos, there is now or the Spark, UA hardware or the period. UA hard well yeah, yeah. The, the UA hardware the whole UAD system there is spark now it is rather limited to start i think there's nine plugins right now the beauty of it is if you already own the plugin you automatically get this for free if you That's don't cool. there is a monthly subscription fee and you can use them as part of a subscription fee and get use of those plugins natively speaking the roadmap from what i understand is that they will eventually start doing a whole lot more of their plugins and make it way more advantageous, much like a Slate Digital or a Plugin Alliance kind of thing. Yeah, that's I, that's one that caught my eye too. I think that's great for UA. I mean, yeah. I think it's going to open up their plugins to a whole new audience that didn't necessarily want to buy into the ecosystem, if you will. Sure. You know, or they might already have interfaces that they're really enjoying working with. So I think this is great. I know, do and, too. And I've already and got it downloaded and installed and checked it all out. And of course, they sound exactly the same as their dongled brothers, I guess would be a right. good way of saying it. <laughs> and that is my Friday find for this week. Sounds good. Awesome. While we've got your attention, we ask that you go to InsideTheRecordingStudio.com and sign up for our mailing list. You'll get weekly reminders about the Tuesday tips when they come out, and we'll make sure you don't miss any future episodes of the podcast. Send us an email at goldstar, G-O-L-D-S-T-A-R, at InsideTheRecordingStudio.com with the word kick, and you'll get something back in your inbox. If you have a topic of suggestion for Chris and I to explain in a future episode, contact us at the contact page and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. With that, I'll say see you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one, Jody. Bye.